All right, so this is the third and final lecture about the mediastinum, and in this lecture we're going to talk about the posterior mediastinum. So the borders and contents, the posterior mediastinum, it's posterior to the heart, and so it, it has the anterior border as the pericardium, anteriorly covering the heart. Then the T5 to T12 vertebrae back here is the posterior border. And then you have the mediastinal pleura laterally on each side. So you have the mediastinal pleura on this side and this side. And then it's continuous with the superior mediastinum. And then the floor is, remember, it extends all the way down to the diaphragm. So the floor of the posterior mediastinum, like the middle and anterior, is the diaphragm. Contents, it contains the esophagus, which is seen here. Uh, the thoracic aorta, also known as the descending aorta, which is seen here. So here you have the ascending aorta, which is in the middle mediastinum, and then that goes up into the arch, which is in the superior mediastinum, and then this is, you know, it's a cross-sectional view, so the arch is cut out, and then you have the descending part, or the thoracic aorta, which is uh, the parts in the posterior mediastinum. Then you have the zygous system and veins, and we'll go through those in much more detail in the vessels lecture, the next lecture. But those are the azygous vein, the hemiazygous vein, and then the accessory hemiazygous vein. You have the thoracic duct, which is the major lymphatic duct in the body that drains a significant portion. We'll go through that again in the vessels lecture. And then you have the sympathetic trunk, which as you can see here, it's nicely labeled here and here on either side of the vertebral column. And you can actually see they have the thoracic duct labeled here as well, traveling along the anterior surface of the vertebral body posterior to the esophagus. So those are all uh, the major structures within the posterior mediastinum. All right, so we're going to spend a good amount of time here now talking about the esophagus. Now, the esophagus, it's a muscular tube that extends from the pharynx, which is this region right here. As you can see, it's labeled here. This is a posterior view that I should point out. So here's the pharynx, and then it extends down. Remember, the pharynx bifurcates into the esophagus posteriorly and the trachea anteriorly. So it extends down from the pharynx into the superior mediastinum, which would be in this region here. And then it descends through the posterior mediastinum and then passes through the diaphragm, which would be down here. It comes down here and it passes through the diaphragm at the T10 vertebral level, right before it joins the, the stomach. So the bulk of the esophagus is actually in the neck and in the thorax, and there's only a couple inches of it that actually travel in the abdomen. And then what it functions to do, is, as you may know already, is it functions to propel uh, your food bolus, which is just you know compacted, chewed up food, propel that via peristalsis to the, to the stomach. So the esophagus has two sphincters, the upper and the lower esophageal sphincter. So the upper esophageal sphincter, it consists of skeletal muscle, and it's going to be found up in this region right here. Even though it's skeletal muscle, this is a key thing to know, it's not under voluntary control. So you don't have any control over this. And what it does is it regulates passage of food from the pharynx into the esophagus. So it's that first gateway when the food makes it down in the pharynx into the esophagus. And it's triggered by the swallowing reflex. So it's a, it's a reflex. That's why it's not under voluntary control. The lower esophageal sphincter is located in this region here. And it consists of smooth muscle. And this is what regulates passage of food from the esophagus into the stomach, specifically the cardiac portion of the stomach. Dysfunction of this sphincter is what leads to GERD, or gas, which is a short for gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is a very, very common problem in the United States, and we'll actually talk a little bit more about this in the clinical pearls section. So one thing to note is the muscle content of the esophagus. This is commonly tested on anatomy exams. It's not terribly high yield for a board exam, but it's, it's a good thing to be aware of, and it's not that hard to remember. So the upper one-third is entirely skeletal muscle, okay? So if we cut this into thirds, and you remember that makes sense because this upper esophageal sphincter is skeletal muscle. Then you kind of get into the middle third, so we'll just go right here. The middle third's a mixture. It's both skeletal and smooth muscle. And then you get down here into the deeper portion with the stomach, and that is entirely smooth muscle. And that makes sense. The lower esophageal sphincter is smooth muscle. And then when you're getting down into that region, it's even more so an involuntary process. All right, so what we're going to talk about here is the position of the esophagus, its spatial relationships to other structures. Really important to know. So it it travels posterior to the trachea, and you can see the esophagus right here. And the trachea is cut away here because it's kind of it's already bifurcated here. But the trachea travels anterior to the esophagus, and then what's really high yield, especially for a board exam, is that it travels posterior to the left atrium. Now the left atrium is, if you went down on this cross section, it's about in this region here, and you can see that it travels posterior to that. And that's important because if the left atrium becomes overloaded with volume, it can expand and then compress the esophagus, which can lead to trouble swallowing. We'll go through this in much more detail in the heart lectures.
Now, it travels anterior to the thoracic duct and the azygous vein system. So here's your thoracic duct labeled here. And one thing to note is that these two structures, the thoracic duct and the azygous vein system, they travel up on the anterior surface of the vertebral bodies. And so that would make sense that they're just posterior to the esophagus. And then it's medial to the thoracic aorta. So here's the thoracic aorta. It's medial to that. The three points of constriction in the esophagus, this is very high yield for anatomy exams. You maybe could see this on a board exam, but again, not super high yield for that. So one thing, but these are a good thing to know if you're taking an anatomy course. So superior end in the neck where it begins. So in this region right here where it comes off the pharynx, that's one point of constriction where the sphincter is. It can also be compressed by the aorta and the left main bronchus. So let's take us down to the cross section here. Here's the esophagus here. Okay. We'll do E for esophagus. Here's the thoracic aorta right here, so we'll do TA for that. And then here, so this would be your left side, this is your right side. This would be your left main bronchus right here. And so when the esophagus is traveling between these two structures here, it's more if, if you want more superior than this cut here, but if when it's traveling between these two structures, it can get caught in there. So it can get constricted in there, and then near the gastric end where it joins the stomach. Some important uh, nerves to talk about in the posterior mediastinum is the vagus nerve, and we'll go through the right and the left. There's actually some unique characteristics in the right versus the left. So first we'll start with the right. The right vagus, it descends lateral to the trachea and posterior to the root of the lung, so let's find it here. So this is right, this is left, and this is a posterior view. As you can see that here, here's the esophagus. The esophagus is posterior to the trachea. So you have the right vagus nerve right here, and it's traveling down, and it travels posterior to the root of the lung. So this would be the root of the lung right here, where the you know the hilum, where you know the bronch the main bronchus and the pulmonary artery and veins are are you know entering and leaving the lung, and then it also uh, travels uh, lateral to the trachea. So here's the trachea, and it's lateral to that. It travels on the posterior surface of the esophagus when it gets down here, and you can see that right here on the posterior sur surface, and it forms a posterior portion of the esophageal plexus. The esophageal plexus is this like network of uh, nerves and autonomic nervous system and ganglia that actually wraps around the entire esophagus. So it's not just on one surface. So there's, there's a posterior and an anterior component. And then it passes through the diaphragm as the posterior vagal trunk. So after it exits this esophageal plexus, it goes through the diaphragm on the posterior surface of the esophagus as the posterior vagal trunk. So the right, this is an important thing to know for anatomy, so the right is the posterior vagal trunk, and the left is the anterior vagal trunk. Okay. Some people like to think of it as like a steering wheel where you put your right hand on the anterior portion and then your left hand on the po on the on the bottom of the steering wheel so that'd be like the top of the steering wheel is anterior the bottom of the steering wheel is posterior that's one way some people like to remember it so the left vagus nerve it descends on the anterior surface of the esophagus so you can't really see it here here's the, here's the left vagus nerve traveling down this way it travels in front of the aortic uh, aortic arch and actually if you remember the the uh, left recurrent laryngeal nerve which comes off the vagus it actually wraps around and goes around the posterior aspect of the arch you can see that right here talk about that in a few slides but here's the left vagus it travels down and then it goes into the anterior so this would be the posterior view this right here where the right is traveling and the left goes on the anterior surface then again just like the right it passes through it comes down and passes through the diaphragm into the anterior vagal trunk so now we'll just talk about a couple clinical pearls relevant to the esophagus so gastroesophageal reflux disease we already kind of mentioned this this is GERD a lot, of, uh, a lot of pharmaceutical money going into this with uh, proton pump inhibitor drugs. So what is uh, GERD? It's regurgitation of stomach acid into the lower esophagus. So you have a bunch of acid here, okay? You have a bunch of acid in, in, the, uh, in the stomach, and then it gets regurgitated back into the esophagus, and the acid, it erodes away and damages the, eso the epithelial lining of the esophagus. And how does that happen is, is it's usually you know weaken, weakness in the in this lower esophageal sphincter can cause regurgitation of acid into here. So Barrett's esophagus, this is sort of a long-term effect of uncontrolled GERD. So if you look at this diagram, it's the stomach, and you can see inside here. Here's the rugae, and we'll go into much more detail about this in chapter four. But if you look, here's the esophagus coming in, and if you remember the histology of the esophagus, it's an epithelial-lined lumen inside of it and so 
what you happen here and what happens here in Barrett's esophagus is Barrett's esophagus by definition is a metaplasia of the normal epithelium of the esophagus transforming into simple columnar. That's what's the definition of Barrett's esophagus. That's what's happened or the patho pathogenesis. Now, metaplasia, what does this term mean? It means when one type of epithelium changes into the other. So normally in the esophagus, you have these kind of elongated squamous cells, and they're stacked. So it's called stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, and so this is your normal, you know, epithelium. Then it gets transformed because in long, say, say long-term GERD, you have all this acid coming in and damaging the, the epithelial lining, causing a lot of inflammation. So the, the cells, they undergo a transformation to help protect themselves, and they train, change into simple columnar epithelium, okay? And so, again, it's not surprising that patients with chronic GERD are at increased risk. The other thing that's really important, and this is common on your boards, is that there's a high association with esophageal adenocarcinoma. So a, a huge uh, risk factor for developing epithelial carcinomas in, in this lower portion of the esophagus. This has also caused an increase uh, in the incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma because of all these people that have long-term uncontrolled chronic GERD. So that's something just to be aware of that, you know, a patient with, who develops esophageal adenocarcinoma, it's often common that it was preceded by Barrett's, which was preceded by GERD. You could almost think of the process as GERD, not controlled, you get Barrett's, and then eventually you get adenocarcinoma. And because of this, adenocarcinoma is actually more commonly found in the lower portion of the esophagus, which is not too surprising because that is where the immediate exposure to stomach acid occurs. Mallory-Weiss syndrome, this is defined as when you have a longitudinal, so down the length of the esophagus, a laceration, a longitudinal laceration in the esophagus. And what this is common in is in alcoholics and patients with bulimia. So alcohol, alcohol is you know, very damaging to the, the epithelial lining. And then patients with bulimia, they're often throwing up. So they're throwing up stomach contents, stomach acid. So you see a trend here. Patients that consistently expose the lining of the esophagus to very damaging uh, substances. Borhoff syndrome, this is very serious, life-threatening. It, it, what it is is it's a rupture of the esophageal wall. So you have the esophagus in here. So it actually ruptures, and then it can start leaking out. Common causes is medical procedures, so endoscopies. So endoscopies, when they, you know, a gastroenterologist will thread a, uh, you know, a small camera or a small camera at the end of a tube down the down the person's throat and into the esophagus to take a look around. So that puts patients at risk for uh, Borhoff syndrome because the medical procedure can cause the, the rupture itself. Trauma, so any kind of trauma that happens in here, and then also progress progression from an existing pathology. So if you have a patient with Mallory Weiss uh, syndrome that can progress to that longitudinal laceration can end up progressing to the point of where it breaks open and, you know, results in Borhoff syndrome. And alcoholics, you know, who are at risk for Mallory Weiss syndrome are, you know, at risk for eventually then developing Borhoff syndrome. Complications is a, a pneumomediastinum. You have air that ends up leading, leaking into the mediastinal space. You know, pneumo meaning air, mediastinum. So air leaks out of the esophagus and then it builds up in the mediastinal space. How do you diagnose this? You do a chest CT, so you get an image like this, and you can see, you know, the pneumomediastinum. You can see the break in the esophagus potentially. And then the way you treat this is surgical emergency. So this is something, you know, someone's going to get called in the middle of the night to go fix. The thoracic aorta, it's the descending portion of the aorta that travels along the anterior surface of the vertebrae, so kind of anterior lateral in the thorax, and then it continues through the diaphragm at the T12 uh, vertebral level, and then it becomes the abdominal aorta. And remember that, you know, just to review that dome uh, concept here. So this is the dome of the diaphragm. You have the IVC, which comes down at T8. Then you have the esophagus coming down at T10 that passes through at T10, and then you have the aorta, which goes down at T12. So I always like to think of it as going down the slope because of that sloped or dome shape of the diaphragm. So you start with IVC and then just go by twos down. The major branches in the posterior mediastinum are the posterior intercostal arteries, which you can see these arteries here coming off and traveling in the uh, intercostal spaces. So they supply the intercostal spaces. Then the bronchial arteries, which supply the tracheobronchial tree, and then, and then the lungs as well. So those are those bronchial arteries. They come off this thoracic aorta. Uh, 
Then you have the esophageal arteries, which supply the esophagus, and then the superior phrenic arteries that su supply the superior aspect of the diaphragm, so in here. And that concludes our discussion of the posterior mediastinum and actually wraps up all the lectures about the mediastinum. So now we're on to the vessels of the thorax next.